Choice is popular and is particularly popular among the less well-off. Many people think that choice is a kind of middle-class obsession, but actually the evidence from the British Social Attitude Survey and elsewhere shows that on the whole it's those with the lowest incomes, those with the lowest educational qualifications, those in the lowest social classes are the ones who want choice. Everybody wants choice, but they want it more, a higher proportion of them want than do the better off. And in a way, that's understandable um, because the middle classes always, ha they, they usually have a way of manipulating non-choice systems. Uh, they, can, they can deal with bureaucracies, they can deal with professionals, they can ring up the doctor or they can ring up a friend and find out where the best place to go is and then arrange and negotiate with the GP to go to that best place. In schools, they can move house. They can move house near to the good schools. It's the less well-off who don't have those opportunities of the ones who often favour this idea of choice. As a senior policy advisor to the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, Professor Julian Legrand was one of the prime movers behind the choice and competition agenda in the National Health Service. Three years after leaving Downing Street, his zeal for public sector reform remains unabated. The choice and competition policy, I think, has been broadly successful. We've introduced choice for schools, we've introduced choice for patients, uh, particularly for elective surgery, um, and it, it, they really had, it, there were two aims. One was because we think that choice is a good thing in and of itself and that people want choice, and there's lots of evidence to suggest that people do actually want to have choice, particularly the less well-off. It's the less well-off are the ones who really want choice. Um, but also because the fact that people have got choice means that they can, if they're getting a bad service from somewhere, a school or a hospital or whatever, they can go somewhere else. And that gives an incentive for the school or hospital that is losing people, that losing patients, losing pupils, gives them an incentive to improve. If you were still a government health advisor, what would you be urging the government to do now? I think an interesting development, and it was actually the last paper that I wrote for Tony Blair before I left Number 10, was on what are called patient budgets. Um, this is the idea, now this comes from, from social care. Now, in social care, uh, we're now experimenting with something called individual budgets by which we give, instead of providing a service to a disabled person, give it, providing them with a wheelchair or providing them with, a, with help in their home or carers to look after them, we give them the money instead and allow them to make the relevant decisions about what they should get. Now this has been a very popular policy uh, among the disabled, disabled people. They've really, it, it has improved their well-being both in terms of physically but also psychologically. They, they comment that they, at last they feel in control of things. They aren't at the mercy of some bureaucracy that's deciding what they should get. But one of the comments they keep making is, well, why can't, why can't we do that in health too? Why can't we actually extend this to, to, to buy things that will improve our health as well as our social care? Uh, and indeed, uh, that is an idea that we're now beginning to develop in, in the latest review of the National Health Service, the idea of patient budgets, particularly for people with long-term care, say diabetes or, or whatever. Um, the idea of giving them the budget so they can decide what services they, they require. And you're also a supporter of more choice and competition in the state education sector, what would you like to see? I think it's quite interesting in education. Um, there have been two sort of major developments. One has been the introduction of parental choice um, uh, of school, or, and trying to, I mean, it, it's imperfect, the amount of choice that parents have, but at least it, it's much greater than it ever was. But also has been the setting up of kind of independent institutions, or giving schools an increasing amount of independence from the local education authority and so on. An obvious example of that is the Academies program, um, but indeed, but there are more generally trust schools. There are schools that, that have been given a great deal of independence. And again, I think that's a very important development because that gives schools the freedom and the opportunity to experiment, to innovate, um, to do their own thing in a way that I think can only improve the overall educational standards of the country.
There's one specific program that I would like to see the government pick up, which is that of the pupil premium. The idea behind the pupil premium is that children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds have a larger sum of money attached to them when the school takes them on. At the moment when the school takes on people, uh, pupils, they get uh, a fixed sum of money for each pupil they take on. Here the idea is that that amount of money will be larger for those who come from deprived backgrounds, poor postcodes basically. It so happens that the Conservatives actually have picked up on that idea, the pupil premium idea, and so have the Liberal Democrats. Um, this is slightly embarrassing for me because I put forward the idea in the late 1980s and uh, I am slightly saddened that um, our, uh, the current government, uh, which I've advised, has not yet picked it up. However, they haven't ruled it out, so I'm hoping that in the long run they will do that. Can you honestly put your hand on your heart and say, after everything that's happened in the financial markets over the past few months, that you still want more quasi-market solutions to public sector problems? I think I can, uh, because actually those markets are really very different from the kind of markets that I'm talking about. The financial markets, the banking sector, has all sorts of peculiarities that make it a very odd market indeed, and one really that does not have many lessons for the way that markets operate outside that. Thank mm -hmm. you.